Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Deb Clemens, and I'm Assistant Director of Public and Academic Programs at the RISD Museum. This evening, our program is Viewpoints, Queer Art, with my museum colleagues, Christina Alderman, Emily Bannis, and Connor Moynihan. I'd like to just take a moment to start the evening off with um, us looking and reading through our land acknowledgement. This is an ongoing developing acknowledgement museum staff is, has been working on and, and researching. I'll read it now. The RISD Museum is built on what is now called College Hill, part of the ancestral territory of the Narragansett people. Many indigenous communities have moved through this area over hundreds of generations and indigenous people from many nations near and far continue to live, study and work in Providence today. We as museum staff are committed to actively addressing in our daily work, our shortcomings as their neighbors and the many violent legacies of colonialism. An acknowledgement of native, native voices and histories is crucial to this work as we move forward to rectify the destructive past. And we welcome our speakers to lead us off. Um, I'd love for you to each introduce yourselves briefly and we can, um, we can get going if you have any needs you can message me in the chat. I'm happy to help and put any resources in that space as well. My name is Christina Alderman and I manage family and teen programs at the RISD Museum. Hi, I'm Connor Moynihan. I'm the curatorial fellow in the Prince Drawings and Photographs Department at the RISD Museum. And I use he, him, his. And I'm Emily Bannis. I'm the assistant curator of decorative arts and design at the RISD Museum. Welcome everybody. Thank you for all joining us here tonight for this Viewpoints conversation that is centered on queer art. I'm excited to be joined by my colleagues where we'll share our viewpoints on a select group of objects from the museum's collection um, and also hear your viewpoints and questions about the works we're going to talk about tonight. The first thing that I'd like to do is situate everyone with the terminology that we're going to be using. So what do we mean when we use the word queer and what is queer art? Um, there are many ways that people define the word queer and we each want to share how we interpret it. Um, to me, the word queer is really an umbrella term. Um, it encompasses the many identities and expressions of both gender and sexuality that exist beyond the cisgender and heterosexual binaries. And when I say cisgender, I'm talking about people whose gender identity matches the sex that they were assigned at birth. I also want to acknowledge that queer can be a polarizing term and recognize that although this historically negative word has been reclaimed in the past few decades to have a more positive and inclusive connotation, um, which describes both individuals and a community, that this word still carries a significant emotional weight for some people. Thanks, Emily. Um, so I, for me, I just like want to start on a more personal level. I identify with the word queer. That's how I identify more so than gay. But more generally, queer for me is about orientation to others. And by that, I mean bodies or objects or animals or moods. Um, and I think I think sexuality is a part of it. Gender is also a part of it. But I'm really interested in the affective attachments that queer carries, be that shame or pride, rage and disgust. And I think that's absolutely part of, of, of queerness for me. And I see queer as a relational term. I find it something that's hard to pin down, but easy to find. And I find that queerness, uh, it's what opens up the what is and how things always have been to new and imaginary possibilities. So I see it sort of as a starting point of moving from here to somewhere else. Thank you guys. Um, I echo the sentence of my colleagues of the complexity of this term and the expansiveness of this term. And for me, it's a, it's a term of possibility. And while it can't be separated from its relationship to gender and sexuality, it's far more expansive than that. And it's a rejection of those widely accepted constructions around, as Emily mentioned, cisgendered, heteronormative, binary spaces in trying to create more inclusive, non-normative spaces. It's how I work with the word term queer. 
And um, I can transition to talking about what queer art is in a rather evasive answer because working with the public, my parameters around what one may and may not identify as queer artworks can change in the context of the conversation I'm in. Um, and so I want to say that it's, I, I'm, I welcome these open questions around the way queer art relates to gender, sexuality, and these imaginative spaces that um, Connor mentioned. But again, it's an ever evolving term as I'm in dialogue with many people. Yeah, I was really thinking about this question, like how to define queer art. In some ways, I've, I've done it when I'm like breaking it down for a class in a very basic way. I say, you know, queer art, I can think of it like through three ways. You know, we have queer art that has, what we might readily identify as queer subject matter or, or, or queer imagery in it. Um, but I also, in my, when I talk about queer art, I also mean art that is made by LGBTQIA plus artists who might not be centering a queer image or a queer theme in the work themselves. But when I talk about queer art, I sort of, I do include, include that as well. Um, and I also think that queer art is questioning. So it, 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 there's a political state to queer. And I think work that questions the limits of things can be categorized as queer art. So I think it's a very porous category. And like Christina said, I don't want to lock it down. I do want to keep it open. Uh, and um, so I, I sort of like to see how things emerge, right? So there's there's ways that it can be very cut and dry, but I also like to use it much more organically. And I also like using the word queer to describe art, especially if we're looking at longer periods of art. Um, because, you know, over time, there's been many different manifestations and re arrangements of, of gendered and sexual life. And queer is ahistorical, it's something that we're applying backwards. And so it's a way that we can talk about difference, specifically sexual or gender difference, without sort of getting too lost sometimes in the historical context, right? Realizing that there is a history to queerness, whether or not the same words were used to describe it. And to me, queer art is any form of the visual arts, be it painting or film or design, whose subject centers on imagery and or themes of queerness. I wouldn't um, define all work made by queer artists as queer art, particularly when we think about the decorative arts. There are a lot of queer artists and queer makers who are producing objects that aren't connected to ideas and themes of queerness. Um, but I think you know how I perceive queer art is always changing and evolving and has certainly become a little bit broader with a lot of the conversations that I've been having with my colleagues um, lately. But tonight we are going to talk about some queer art, um, art that was recently acquired by the RISD Museum last month. Um, but before we dive in, I want to quickly touch upon the topic of acquisitions at the RISD Museum. Um, in 2018, the RISD Museum established a new set of guidelines for acquiring artwork for the collection, underscoring our commitment to collecting works by underrepresented artists. And we use the term underrepresented artists to refer to people who are historically and presently excluded from museums including but not limited to Black, Indigenous, peoples of color, LGBTQIA plus identifying individuals, people with disabilities, and women. We have also committed 75% of our acquisition budget to collecting works by underrepresented artists. And one of my personal goals has been to bring both queer artists and queer artworks into the decorative arts and design collection, um, which is where our works are going to come in tonight. So the first artist and artwork that I'm going to talk about tonight is titled God Save the Queens by the artist Leopold Fulem, who you see here. Fulem is a gay identifying Canadian artist who works in the medium of ceramics. His work juxtaposes historical genres and forms with contemporary techniques such as the use of factory made decals. His imagery is often associated with camp, 
and queerness as he parodies historical figures and stories to deconstruct issues of gender and queer identity. His cast clay forms, um, which is the central portion of this work here, um, are often mounted in elaborate repurposed metal mounts, which reference historic blue and white porcelain that was often mounted in silver and gold fittings, such as the ones that you see here, um, which both would increase the value of the object, but sometimes alter its functionality. A popular design element of porcelain is this central framing device um, inside which one might see a scene with figures interacting in a landscape, sometimes something light and whimsical. But here, Fulham is really highlighting something a little different. Um, we have a factory made decal of a very white Italian Baroque representation of Christ in a crown of thorns. And this is juxtaposed with the phrase, God save the Queens. Now, what does this mean? I want to zero in on the use of the text and the imagery together for a second, because without the text, I think this image would really read quite differently. The artist has chosen the phrase, not just God save the queen, um, but the plural queens. And as some of you might be familiar with the term queen or queens um, to describe a flamboyant or effeminate gay man, um, and I would also read this as a reference to drag queens. So here we have the gays, the drag queens. Why is Jesus talking about gays and drag queens? Um, in fact, what is Jesus doing on this object? Uh, does the depiction of Jesus make us see this object differently? Does it become a religious object just because it has an image of Jesus on it? There's also the nature of the text, um, God Save the Queens. It's an appeal of Christ to God, um, really thinking about the idea of salvation. So I'll go back to my original question, what does this mean? And you'll notice by now I'm asking more questions than I am actually providing answers, but this is really just to show that there's no one interpretation, there's no one answer to this work. And I'm merely just providing some lines of thought by which I've been thinking about this object. I will say that the tone of this image is really much different than a lot of traditional Christian iconography. And here Fulham has created a space for the queens, for the gays, in what can be read as a narrative about salvation. I wanna shift our focus around to the side of the object. On each side, there is this image of a sailboat. And I think it's worth mentioning that Fulham's original intent was to have a sailboat on one side of the object and a steamboat on the other, which sounds a little interesting. Um, and this, in talking with the artist, I found out that this was meant to be a play on a French expression, um, one that I have written here called uh, Etre et voile et avec père, which literally translates to, as to be sailing or steaming. And this was uh, actually used to describe people who are bisexual. And in talking to the artist, he likened um, this French expression to the equivalent in English um, to describe bisexuals as ACDC. Some, a term that some people might be familiar with. And unfortunately, he was not able to find an appropriate image of a steamboat to put on the side of this artwork, which is why we have the two decals of the ships instead. But I think it's kind of interesting to think about the artist's process and the artist's intent. And although we don't typically talk about what is not there in a work, I think it's kind of interesting in this case to consider. So I'm going to leave this work for now, and I'm going to let my colleagues come back to it in a bit. And I'm going to move on to the next um, artist and set of artworks that we want to think about tonight. And that is these two plates, which were made by the artist Howard Kotler, who you see here. Kotler was a trained ceramicist who shifted in the 1960s from wheel thrown and hand-built works 
to really experimenting with ceramic decals on factory made porcelain plates, which is what we have here. He used his work to satirize American popular culture, often distorting images of his decals in order to blur the lines between reality and illusion. Kotler and Fulem's work share a lot of similarities, and I always have a tendency to talk about Fulem's work first, but Kotler's predates his by at least two decades. And in thinking about their artwork and the times in which they were made, um, the experience of being gay in the 1960s in America was quite different than the experience of being gay in the 1990s in America or Canada. Although the 1960s saw hints of progress in the gay liberation movement, including states beginning to repeal anti-sodomy laws and the Stonewall riots, which was a major event that catalyzed the gay rights movement, being queer and out and visible at this time was still not safe for many people. And we could even say in 2021, the world still isn't always a safe place and a welcoming place for queer people. Kotler, who identified as gay, simultaneously addressed and dodged his homosexuality in his works. And like a lot of other artists of his time, he used coded references to queer culture that were all at once whimsical and entirely palatable for a mainstream audience, but were simultaneously subversive and loaded with symbolism. These two plates are just two of several designs that Kotler made in a series about Blue Boy and Pinky. And if these two figures look a little familiar to you, it's because Kotler drew inspiration from these two paintings. So on the left, we have Thomas Lawrence's Sarah Gooden Barrett Moulton, AKA Pinky. And on the right, we have Thomas Gainsborough's Blue Boy. And these two have often been paired together in popular culture. And this was due to the American railroad tycoon and art collector, Henry Edward Huntington, who purchased this pair of portraits nearly 150 years after they were painted and hung them together in his library and invited the public to come and view them. And it was really this act that made people associate these two paintings, these two figures as a couple, um, even though they would have never met in real life. In the first plate titled Twins, Kotler replaces the head of Blue Boy with that of Pinky. And this one little change really alters the way we interpret this scene. And our perceptions change even further depending on whether or not we read this as two different figures or one figure in two different outfits. If it's the former, and if there are two figures, then does this change this traditionally viewed heterosexual couple? Do they now become a queer couple? And if this is one figure, can we read this as performing one's gender, dressing in drag, or somehow hiding and concealing one's identity? And that's really picked up um, in the next plate, which is titled Incognito. Incognito, we see Pinky and Blue Boy with a black sensor bar across their eyes. And sensor bars are a basic form of text, video, or photography censorship in which, quote, sensitive information or images are blocked by the use of a black bar. In fact, the use of the sensor bar is typically um, used to make one's identity harder to recognize. Even the title itself, Incognito, is all about concealing one's true identity. And I think that's a theme that's all too common among those in the queer community who feel like they need to conceal their identity, their queerness, in order to pass or blend in or conform in order to feel safe in this world. And I'm gonna turn it over to Connor to share his thoughts on these works.
Thanks, Emily. And thank you for introducing us to Leopold Flem and Howard Kotler's fascinating work. Until you brought them to our attention, I was not aware of either of these artists, and I find their approaches very illuminating and quite playful. I want to address these works through a few concepts discussed in queer theory, as I think they connect so seamlessly. In Flem's work, which we see here, I sense a variety of emotions coursing through it. The playful text, as, as Emily discussed, God Save the Queens, speaks to pride. It is an appropriation of a common phrase, but with a minor twist, pluralizing queen to queens, thereby moves the subject away from Queen Elizabeth to a potentially unlimited amount of so-called queens, presumably gay men, queers, or drag queens. <clears throat> At the same time, its Christian iconography brings about memories of shame and not belonging for me when I see this work. So God Save the Queens makes me feel quite ambivalent. In 1999, performance studies scholar Jose Esteban Munoz detailed a theory of disidentification. With disidentification, which is a performative survival strategy, Munoz was trying to describe how minoritarian subjects manage ambivalent relationships to oppressive, homophobic, and racist culture by desiring with a difference. Disidentification for Munoz was a mediating term between ident identification or full assimilation of dominant culture and counter-identification as full rejection of dominant culture. For Munoz, disidentificatory performances were ways for queers, and in particular queers of color, to survive and thrive in a world that had no investment in their survival. And here, in this work by Folem, we can glimpse what might be easily described as an act of disidentification. The form and iconography of this ceramic vessel makes direct links to Christianity uh, and Catholicism, while there are many examples to the contrary, it is still fair to say that many Christian and Catholic queers feel an ambivalence between who they are and what is taught in certain doctrines of Christianity. A counter identification, though, would necessitate for them to make a full break with this tradition, and yet I find that lacking in this work. He revels in it. We see Jesus, his skin glowing and eyes raised in near ecstasy up to the heavens, a rather desirous twinkle in his eyes. This is very much a queer Jesus, a Jesus who desires differently. Moreover, what I love about this work from a queer perspective is Philem's refusal to identify fully with Christianity or entirely negate it. We find ourselves in a disidentificatory space where we can find sustenance where it wasn't necessarily intended for us. Further, this simple transformation opens up our minds to new arrangements that possibly could be. It becomes like a queer horizon line of possibility. For me, this is Munoz's disidentification at its best. And I want to turn now to these fabulously campy plates by Howard Kotler whose simple surfaces belie a remarkable tongue-in-cheek commentary on gender and sexuality. And I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to keep my thoughts brief as I discuss just one of the two plates. As we look at twins seen here on the left, we have the bodies of Blue Boy and Pinky, but each with the head of Pinky, as Emily discussed. At least for me, I noticed this revision slowly. Caught up as I was in the fluttering of Pinky's yellowy frock and Blue Boy's rather to die for monochromatic ensemble, I had a rather aha moment when I realized the transformation that Kotler had made. And it is in the subtlety of that transition that makes it land all the more powerfully. Be it Blue Boy or Pinky in drag, they come close to passing so that we nearly miss what is happening right before our eyes. Queer theorist and philosopher Judith Butler has done great work in unpacking the performativity of gender. She argues that all gender is citational, that we enter gender through language, that is being named a boy or a girl at birth, and then we fit ourselves into these molds. What Butler points out is that this repetition posits a naturalism or an essentialism to gender that simply does not exist. Through Butler, there is no essential gender that we can retrace from one individual all the way back until we might get to some primordial Adam or Eve from which it all sprang. Denying any such origin point for gender, Butler 
For Butler, it is precisely through that long chain of repetition that subversion and change can manifest. The citation of gender is exactly the moment where one can subvert what gender was intended to be and thereby open up new possibilities for being differently. I love thinking about Butler through this work precisely because Kotler is also citing many copies and iterations of these two figures, as Emily mentioned. And in his hand, it manages a subtle flip, a pivot that could easily be missed if we only glanced at this, maybe in, in some elsewhere imaginary display cabinet. Yet once your glance lands and you notice it, it can be transformational, transformational in the smallest, campiest way. It negates the tropes of gender that Blue Boy and Pinky typify to absurdity, and our recognition of this flip lets us in on this joke. And more than that, hopefully, it allows us to loosen up what is possible in the long citational chains of gender and sexual normativity. Thank you for that. Thank you, both of you. So um, when Emily mentioned she was acquiring these works of art, you know, I really began to think about uh, what I identify in the collection as being queer works or having the potential impact on those of us who identify as queer and the different members of the public I interact with. So I wanted to explore some of those um, works as part of this conversation. And before I dive into some sort of comparative analysis, I want to talk about how doing this kind of work and talking about queer art has a real tangible impact because when you're a person and you don't see yourself in society sometimes you don't even have the words to define something like queer and it can feel you in a leave you feeling in a way that i would call a kind of limbo and this piece was conjures a really deep memory of when a fellow amber lopez brought this work out for a group of my youth and many of us were moved, but one of them eventually started to tear up because for them it was the first time they were seeing a positive same-sex same couple interacting together and with a child and what that did to them. And we sat there and we just hugged in front of this work um, and didn't need words because it's deeply complex. So in a way to acknowledge the um, importance of this work as well as the inability to always define everything and capture all the nuances and the moments that we can that exist within the possibilities of art and the ways that art can help us um, interpret our past see the world differently as well as imagine new perspectives new futures in the case of the student that i was working with speaking of past let's go to the next one when Emily presented these two works, this amphora immediately thought in my mind, because, you know, as Connor mentioned, are they a couple? Is it the same person? We don't know. But this vase is always an interesting talking point because what we see in here is two men and a couple of cocks in arms of one man and a dog in the other. And while I can't get into all the complexities of ancient Greek relationships and eroticism, we can, for lack of a better term, say this is potentially a homoerotic moment. This, this cock has had a long past of being a symbol of a romantic exchange that's about to happen. And the reason these two situated nicely for me is that it shows the existence of this queerness across time. It takes it from a place of exceptionalism to creating a more normative understanding of the relationship and when you begin to have that power to see these things in different contexts and in different ways, it really opens up you to decode the museum in different ways and see different possibilities throughout um, works of art. So where do you see couples rather than just being side by side, do you see them flirting, having an exchange? Where is gender being played with? I wanna also acknowledge in museums, there is a, tension in the idea of art being very open to interpretation and presenting itself as very loose that people can bring to it what they want, but also museums emphasis on accuracy and truth in the way that that can perpetuate certain normative ideas that we have in our society. And so I want to also play with the fact that there needs to be some 
rethinking and I think querying of objects that we feel we have accurate interpretations of and where we allow for the accuracy of truth and not. So with that, I will jump to the next one. Uh, it is a portrait of Sarah Prince Gill by John Singleton Copley. Working with young people, I also have the privilege of hearing them say the things that adults like to whisper to each other or don't always have the courage to say. And with this portrait, it's very often, is that a guy? And I could simply respond if I wanted to say like truth or something, say, no, it's a woman and launch into something about Sarah Prince Gill. But if we pause for a moment, we can see some deeper questions about what, how one is defining gender and ideas of wealth and power and that's ability to be visibility. So that's why I was thinking of the Kotler sensor bars where one's identity is and is not visible. Because, you know, to the person who says this looks like a guy, I could say something like, you know, yes, you're reading some male features potentially in this, tell me more about it. Um, and then I could talk to them about how the sitter was more interested in depictions of intelligence and perhaps ownership of their land in the background rather than an idealized feminine beauty. Um, I could say that uh, Copley didn't, you know, there was chances are that this dress didn't really exist, this background didn't exist, and he took liberties to actually make this person's looks potentially more in line with idealized beauty. We could talk about a number of these things, but we could also, and keep going on on that route, we could also talk about the way Sarah Gill was also in some ways not normative. You know, she resisted marriage for six years, or, or no, sorry, resisted marriage for many, many years and ended up marrying somebody she was six years older than, uh, was the person who had a bulk of the wealth in the household, eventually gave in to, for pious reasons, marriage, but um, had a long-standing belief that women's brains decreased in marriage in proportion to the ways that men's brains grew. So these are not ways that we see people embodying traditional idealized understandings of marriage and romance at a time when that was a woman's function. We, what we can see here is a skewing of identity through many normative interpretations we have of what we expect from society but a possibility of this woman trying to present herself as an intellectual in a very different way and being the person who was commissioning the work would have a fair bit of say in how she was physically depicted. So maybe this was how she felt beautiful and this is what we can take, you know, the masculinity of her features or could have been something that she embraced. We don't know, but we read these things in what having other queer works and do is put in the dialogue and say, yes, I find this just as beautiful as you might find something else. And that's a super important moment because again, when we can see these things, when we have our own feelings being validated and we're finding ourselves in connection to art, I mean, you know, art saves, God save the Queens. It, it makes a real difference and impact in people's lives and that possibility. So those were some of the things that Emily set on fire in my brain, which she said, we're gonna be acquiring these. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Christina and Connor. Um, we all have such different perspectives on these works and um, all the works in the museum. And I would love to take anyone's comments thoughts on these works. Um, we can pull them up again um, and just have a, have a conversation and hear about what you're seeing. And we also have questions for each other if people are nervous. <laughs> Connor, did you want to start with the question? Yeah, yeah, I was going to start. I was like, Emily, I was hoping that you could, you know, this is, well, I, maybe I should say, I really enjoy this conversation and I really think what, what Emily and Christina and I were trying to do and hope to do going forward is really get deep and nitty gritty and talking about queer art and try to come to a lot of different approaches and think about it in different ways. And there's so many options and so many ways to approach this. Um, so there's like so much more I could say and want to say, but Emily, I was hoping you could, um, what I was thinking about too is like, how does 
more normative work end up in a queer artwork. I'm thinking of, you know, Cotler's Plates um, with Blue Boy and Pinky. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the cultural innuendos around those two. Yeah, definitely. Um, this was um, something that I've been thinking a lot about because um, if we look at the two paintings, the um, painting by Thomas Lawrence and the painting by Thomas Gainsborough, we have Blue Boy and Pinky. We have a portrait of two figures and they are titled or colloquially known by a color, by a color that even matches with their gender. Um, and this was probably not intentional. I mean, I think associations with gender and color are probably a relatively recent 20th century idea. Um, the idea that we can have or should have color associated with gender. Um, but we have, I think it's something that Kotler was probably or most definitely picking up on this idea that we have blue boy and all of the um, kind of meaning behind the, the term, you know, blue, there's um, blue, uh, blue can be a reference to um, gay or pornographic. And of course, pinky um, has connotations of um, pinky, pinky finger, the femininity that goes along with your raised pinky. Um, it also has connotate phallic connotations to it. Um, so I think that, you know, Cotler definitely understood these uh, ideas and um, it's part of the subtlety of, of his works. I had a question. Can I ask a question? We would love you to ask a question. <laughs> this is Jamie. Um, thank you for those wonderful presentations. Uh, as you know, Emily, I'm super excited. The Rizzi Museum acquired Fulem, uh, who I've really admired for a while. But I, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the valence of, of the words, God save the Queens, um, for him as a Canadian who technically um, uh, shares the national anthem with, you know, God Save the Queen with, with the Britain, but also uh, uh, with the AIDS crisis that was unfolding at the time that yeah. it was made. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, and you're, you're right. Um, the, the God Save the Queens um, or God Save the, the Queen or God Save the Queen, the King, I suppose, depending on the the reigning, the reigning monarch um, in the UK, but yes, that would be um, an anthem in Canada and probably something that Fulham was thinking about um, uh, when he had this, when he was making this work. Um, and you asked the second part of that question. It was the relation to the AIDS crisis and the fact that um, we think of salvation and Christ as a symbol of salvation, but um, mm -hmm. many, gay men were invisible and being neglected at the time. So perhaps a cry for help uh, disguised as a kitsch item, perhaps something like that. Yeah. I think even all the connotations in Catholicism around the body and the blood and, and salvation through that, um, I think it makes it an, a more than a direct nod through, you know, through that, but also, you know, there's a lot of different ways that artists negotiated the AIDS crisis. I think finding humor was something that artists were trying to do as well, right? Trying to find a moment of levity, <laughs> but through all those, you know, and this is why I was like re referencing disidentification, right? How do you, how do you survive in a world that is in, in the AIDS crisis, for example, actively trying to seek out your destruction? Um, and it's those, you know, it's, it's those playing with Christianity, right? He should be the savior for all and he becomes the savior in that work for, for the Queens, mm -hmm. as it were. So I was wondering when we look at historical representations of gender expression, how does it allow us to reflect on generations, um, our generation's depiction of gender and queer identity? I think that's a great question and how I would answer it and I want everyone else to have a chance, is I hope it shows diversity. I think sometimes often we're in our moment and it, everything feels permanent and fixed and this is how everything was all the time. 
And so I think longer look backs of, of to seeing how things were or things were arranged or divided um, shows that things weren't always that way. And what I hope that reveals is things don't have to be the way that they are now either, right? I hope it opens up the way that we understand gender and sexuality because gender and sexuality has never really been mapped consistently in, in, as one way, right? It, it, it has many manifestations across the world. At the same time, I think um, when we look backwards, we also have to avoid this over romanticizing the past, you know, that uh, just because the past had different manifestations doesn't mean it was better. You know, it's, it's holding in tension, those two things for me. Yeah. And that leads me to like one other thing, like in our current climate, as somebody who identifies as a queer artist, how is it that we can find ways to further identify ourselves without having to speak in code? That's a great question. Great question. I have, I mean, I, or Emily or Christina, do you want to say any respond to that? Um, you go ahead, Connor. I was just, I was just going to share one anecdote and I'll, this person will be anonymous, but he's a gay man who is older than me. And we were talking about coding and he said he wished that there was a code that he could just say, do or say, and then all the gay people would be able to recognize that. So there'd just be this shared existence. And I immediately had this like knee jerk reaction away from that um, because I, I'm like, there are not, I don't want to be visible to all gay people. Like there are niches within LGBTQ yeah. populations. So I think the question, the reason I say that is I think the question of codes are really complicated. And I think sometimes it's, do you want, for me, it's like, do you want your gender or sexual identity to be universalized? Or do you want to hold on to like the community base that it can fit into and the codes that circulate there? Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, that definitely, as an art maker, that uh, definitely gives me a lot to think about. So thanks. I, I would think I would just add to that that um, I, I think that I also think you don't, you should, there's not, don't shy away from codes. I mean, there's things that don't need to be expressed to everyone because they are not meant for everyone. So finding your own language and your own way of speaking and again, I think to what Connor's saying, trying to strive for some universality, what, what does that serve or do? Because all you're trying to do is in some ways become more transparent to a normative society that may or may not need you to be a part of it for its existence or want you to be a part of it, unfortunately. And so how do we, you know, how do you speak to the humans that you want to speak to in the language that you want to speak to as an artist? And then, and also being comfortable with people having interpretations of their own when they read it. I think that's sort of, interestingly, the question of um, came up in the chat of, do you think all queer art is subversive? Um, yeah, you guys, I've, but in this, you know, like the feeling of a, of a, when you're speaking in code, I think the question that was brought up um, is, is a feeling that you somehow do have to make it transparent or you're doing something subversive. And that's that's what I would buck against because I don't think, I don't know if you guys, Emily or Connor wanna say more about the subversive question. Um, I, I, I wanna just throw in a, a, a little bit of a note um, about Howard Kotler and about the um, blue boy and pinky plates in that series because it is, known that while his other works were widely distributed, that series of works um, never was. They actually were works that he kept for himself or works that he gave to his probably trusted confidants, his friends, um, you know, people that knew that he was gay, um, even though they are, um, you know, coded uh, and, I think it's very it's very likely the people he gave them to you know they knew what they what they meant to him um, and there are works by Flem uh, that are a little bit you know more overtly queer that show you know very explicit um, scenes of you know queer couples um, so I think there are a lot of different levels and interpretations of of queer art whether or not the artist is 
trying to be, you know, subversive, whether they're trying to do something that is coded, um, just like any other art, it has, you know, many different languages of its own. Yeah, I completely agree with Emily. There's so many different languages and audience is important for subversion. Um, so if you're making art for a smaller social circle, it's explicitly queer art, but it might not be subversive in that way. Um, and it's possible that queer art will lose its subversive capacity as it becomes more assimilated into the mainstream museums and culture. Um, but I do think queer art can be subversive, and I do think that is a strong part of its history and so, a strong part of it, it, its strength. But I don't, you know, I don't think all queer art is necessarily subversive. I can go back to a topic we were having in some of what an earlier question brought up about the stretch of time and time span, because um, Connor and Emily, earlier in our conversations, we were talking about uh, queering temporality and like what it means for timelines. And I think Pinky and Blue Boy, the way they circle time past and present is a nice um, is a nice way of thinking about ways we reimagine and think about time. I don't know if you guys want to say more about what we were talking about in that conversation. Or is that so long ago because it was in Zoom time and we can't remember all the things that we were saying? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember exactly what we were saying. Part of it was because of some other things I was reading between then. So I guess I have two sort of thoughts to time and, and relationships to queerness. Um, so what I remember what I was saying before is a lot of what my interest too with queer um, is, is resisting this, this compulsion to normativity. And I think we see this with, with rhetoric of like things get better as if the things themselves get better, this march forward. And it's not the work of people doing that to get better. And I think there's a lot of people that want to hold on or like resist that march forward. And I think that can be a queer act as well, a queer relationship to time, right? This resistance of, of going forward, of, uh, of, you know, like turning around and never going back, like different, different orientations to futurity. Um, and then another thing, I, since I was citing Munoz, who I really like, you know, his second book, Cruising Utopia, you know, he really has a lot of discussions of, of queer time and what he means by that. And it's really, it does stick, resonates with me. And for him, queer, queerness and queer time is that there it can be something more than the here and the now. That what we are limited by now, we can imagine a different possibility and we can put it on the horizon line and it can be something to aspire towards. And that's a different relationship to time. And it's, it's one that doesn't negate the present, but also it's like, it doesn't let you be defeated by the present. You know, you, the, the future isn't a promise, but you, it's something that gives you to work towards a glimmer of better, a better queer life, which was different from what we talked about. <laughs> but I don't remember what I talked about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, but I, but I very much appreciate um, Connor's. Um, perspective on on time. I'm going to read Sam's question out loud so everyone can hear um, if, they, if they need that. So maybe not a fully developed question, but I keep thinking about Christina's comments about museum culture to encourage fluidity in interpretations, even if it takes away from more concrete representation of queer identities. Do conversations about artwork with queer readings turn these readings into more mainstream interpretations, or do they just add to the fluidity? So the optimist in me wants to say the latter. It leads more to the fluidity. Um, but I'm curious what others would say. I, I keep going back to the phlegm piece in the way in which um, how religion's connection still feels so disconnected from the, from like acceptance of queer identity and, so, and the imagination and ideas uh, for many people and ways that, you know, how it still feels so coded that I'm, st I'm still, you know, I know somebody's going to potentially bristle in the situation if I bring certain things up. And so that to me means that like, we're so far from these things being mainstream, I can't like, I, I, I feel ur still the urgent need 
to do this, to, to talk to people about this, to make this. Um, but my hope is that it is for the fluidity and building a different understanding and creating more expansive um, ways of thinking than it is about like trying to just make something accepted and move on, make something accepted and move on, make something accepted and move on. Yeah, I absolutely, I, I agree with that. I think um, if we had posed these uh, three, three works, the Kotler plates and the Phlegm, um, in a completely different conversation, um, we could have never reached that, you know, interpretation of queerness in these works. Um, but I think it's about, um, you know, expanding the conversation and, and adding to that fluidity. And um, I think they're very far from becoming f mainstream, at least, um, at least these works. If anything, I'm, you know, that isn't always a bad thing. I think that, um, you know, these two artists in particular um, are not as not very widely known, um, especially outside of, you know, museum uh, circles and especially outside of decorative arts and, you know, bringing them back into public consciousness um, can be a really powerful thing. We have a couple of minutes left for final thoughts and, and just for you all to, to share your thoughts too. One more question in the chat. So I am of the belief that everything is political. Um, and, and, and Connor or, or Christina or oh, Emily, could you read that question again out loud? Sure, I'll read it. So Nikki wrote, interpreting art with these queer readings is inherently political. How do you interpret queer art without this political perspective? And my answer, which is maybe a dodge, is that I, I don't, I think all art is political. Everything is, I think everything has a politics to it. Um, could I step into another political perspective to interpret it? I'm not sure, but um, but I think it's hard to to unlink a work to politics. I would say that, especially in the context of a museum, a situation that has power and authority, you can't escape the political interpretation, the political, the politics of the interpretation, because everything's a choice and it's backed by money and it's backed by scholarship and it's backed by all of these things so these are all positions of which are coming to the decisions and coming to the inclusions and coming to the creation of what the situation for this artwork so those all those things in you know um, for lack of a better word put the artwork into a political context and political position so uh, potentially outside of a museum i would see more maybe a different relationship to this question but within the context of a museum i don't know I, I couldn't, can't say it beyond being a political. Yeah, and I see. I see. Ren Ren says queer existence is is political. I would I would absolutely say the same. And then Nikki, I think I understand your question now. Maybe a little bit different. It was interpreting art through these queer readings, which I did. Right, I, I was reading scholars and I was interpreting these works. And so then, how would you interpret the art without the political perspective as coming from the readings? Is that closer to what you were asking? Okay. Um, I would say then, you know, I mean, I still read with my own politics and I still would come up with my own interpretation through my understandings of the world, which I think is a personal politics. So it's a similar answer, but I do think I could, I could interpret these works without those readings. And I think I could come to different or similar, but the act of interpretation is still me, the doing of that. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily the readings in themselves. And I read the question as readings, as in reading the artwork, not reading the readings mm -hmm. you were talking about. <laughs> it's all complicated. <laughs> um, great. Right, any final um, parting thoughts or words you could leave us with? Thank you for all being here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And stay safe. <laughs> Thank you, Emily, Christina, and Connor for sharing this tonight. I really appreciated your perspectives. And thanks to all of you for attending and sharing your thoughts and comments.